Well, good morning. Thank you very much to the organizers for bringing me here. It's a great pleasure. And uh, today I will talk about a new aspect of uh, the work that we are conducting in this place, in Neurospin, south of Paris. Uh, as you know, I'm trying to use uh, tools of uh, neuroimaging combined with uh, cognitive psychology. And in, in the past, I've worked a lot on what happens when we understand a number or when we read a word. But uh, recently, we've uh, decided with Christophe Pallier in particular to begin to study what happens when we read two numbers or when we read two words. It's a major progress in our, in our field. And uh, so we're trying to understand what happens when we combine several words, basically. I think I won't uh, tell you much when I tell you that language is recursive and allows speakers uh, to combine basic elements to create nested expressions, such as happy linguists make a diagram. And, um, of course, syntax is present also in uh, mathematical expressions, and we can discuss whether it's present in music or in action plans as well. Uh, Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch postulated that recursion might be a uniquely human evolution. And so we are interested in what happens at the brain level. I'm actually quite convinced there's a major problem for neuroscience and that there is a neural code missing, basically, uh, that may or may not be unique to the human brain. So we would like to understand whether the brain contains a single recursion system how constituents are coded at the neural level. And uh, this is why we started to uh, perform experiments with Christophe Pallier and at the beginning, Anne-Dominique de Vauchel on the constituent structure of language. And then I'll tell you a little bit about our inquiry in mathematics and music. Um, we started with a very simple hypothesis, which is that in a region of the brain that constructs trees, we might expect that the activation should increase with the size of the tree. In the discussion, we might discuss uh, the reasons why this might be so, and uh, it might relate, for instance, to some of Paul Smolensky's uh, proposals. Now, uh, we, so we sort of started with this naive idea that activation may increase each time there is a merge operation needed to bind two constituents. And uh, so uh, we would expect activation to be ordered in this manner for increasingly larger constituents in this very naive picture. Of course, the actual um, elementary objects may be more complicated than words. Um, now, in this example, of course, this would be a bad experiment because constituent size is confounded with number of words. So we wouldn't know whether we're really looking at constituents. So we created stimuli that had a fixed number of words, always 12 words, but manipulating constituent size inside them. So we started with a long sentence like this one. This was all done in French initially. So, il reçoit un sac de céréales cultivées dans le nord de pays, a right branching sentence. And we took uh, bits of it, basically. So one word constituent, two word constituents, uh, three word constituents, they could be taken from different places in the sentence. So this is a six word constituent. And of course, there is a 12 word uh, sentence. And we chose 12 because it has many divisors. So we could um, create lists of 12 words that ranged from a full sentence on the top here to uh, deconstructing it progressively to go down to a word list where we actually controlled that you, there was nothing you could do with more than a single word. So these are translated in English. They are rough uh, you know, adaptations to English. Uh, you can see, for instance, this forward example. You get mayor of the city hates this color. They read their names. You can make pieces of three or four words, and you can make three pieces of four words, but you can't do much more than that. Um, and you can also see on this slide that we had a separate manipulation, which was uh, to remove the semantic content as much as we could by creating Jabberwocky versions of these sentences. So this becomes two years of the roti. It feuds this data. They jeed their ways or something like that. And you can, of course, the argument is that you can still apply syntactic rules, but the meaning is largely gone. Although you still know who is doing what to whom and the plural and so on. Um, so th we created this hierarchy. Basically, there are six conditions here um, with the hope that there would be monotonic changes in fMRI activation to these sentences. And um, especially, uh, we try to imagine how neural activity could look like. This is still a very naive model. I, the title of the talk is really in search of the constituent structure. So we don't have a real model for what is happening at the neural level. But we know that in working memory situations, uh, neurons, especially in prefrontal cortex, um, build up their activation successively for each additional item that you store in working memory. So we sort of expected something similar in the language domain, that if you have to store a 12-word constituent, you may have building up of activation each time you're adding 
to this constituent structure. And this would therefore create as a function of time, as you see 12 successive words, a sort of build up activation and it might collapse each time you realize that the next word cannot be uh, entered into a given constituent. Once you convolve this with the hemodynamic response that you have in fMRI, you would predict what you see on the right, a buildup of activation with constituent structure, but also a shift in time. Because as you see, the weight of the activation in these constructions become more and more late in the process. And it's quite intuitive. I think it would be a feature of many models that as you build up sentence structure, you can, there are certain operations of building up that you can only do late in the structure. So the details of the experiment, that there were two groups of subjects, one for normal prose and one for Jabberwocky. In each case, we have the cis level of constituent structure. Importantly, in this first experiment, we used visual presentation, one word every 300 milliseconds. And this is a very clean format for doing these sorts of experiments because there is no change at all in the surface features of the stimulation uh, across the six levels of constituent structure. We later replicated with an auditory paradigm. It was a slow event-related design, so we could see the shape of the activation to every single sentence. And the task of the subject, we really like to study spontaneous construction uh, of uh, syntactic structures. So we simply asked the subjects to read uh, these sentences, and very rarely there would be a silly sentence that would say, now please click the button, and so the subjects would click the button. That's all they had to do. They were also told that there would be questions at the end of the experiment, and we asked them whether they had seen a specific word or not. So just to maintain their attention and look at the normal comprehension of language. Um, the findings of the experiment were the following, that we found a network of areas, um, which you can see here, whose activation was completely monotonic with uh, the constituent size, although the number of words was constant. And you can see their organization here. They are all in the left hemisphere. They also include the putamen below the cortex. These are all the cortical areas here. They include the inferior frontal regions as well as four successive areas in the superior temporal sulcus. Maybe this is a pointer, great. Okay, so you can see also there is a certain geometry to this organization, which I find very intriguing. Um, when we move to Jabberwocky, only three of these areas were maintained. And these are the three areas in red here. And the other three cortical areas in yellow collapsed completely, suggesting that there is a core network which is involved in syntactic building operations. And these other areas may have more to do with the building of, of semantic representations. So you see the activation here. And they slide in each of these graphs, you see the six levels of constituent structure. C12 is the full sentence. And you can see, for instance, in this anterior STS region, which is here in yellow, there is a very nice increase with constituent structure, uh, but uh, there is virtually none when you move to Jabberwocky. Okay. And you can see that there are really two kinds of regions, like temporal pole is very characteristic here. Very nice climbing up of the activation, nothing with Jabberwocky. Okay. But there are other regions, and there is really three of them here, where you can see the increase is essentially the same, completely parallel, uh, whether you're dealing with Jabberwocky or not. And here, and here as well suggesting that these areas really don't need semantic information in order to do their job. Maybe they're only looking for the morphemes that we are providing them. There was also this prediction about the timing, and it turned out to be completely validated. So if you look at this profile of activation, I hope you can see it, and these are four different regions here, you can sort of guess that the peak of the activation, this is a function of time, is shifting to the right as a function of the constituent structure of the stimuli. Okay. And this is for normal speech. This area is not very activated by Jabberwocky, but if you look at these other three which are shared between normal and Jabberwocky sentences, you can see this shift. It's quite systematic, although it's small. We have a way to quantify the phase of the brain activation simply by fitting a sine and a cosine to these activation functions. And this gives us essentially a systematic phase which can be expressed in seconds which gives us an indication of how slow the activation is. And, and, in, and in other work, we've shown that really, when people say that fMRI is not sensitive to time, it's not true. We can get down to the level of about 200 millisecond resolution for the onset and duration of this activation. And you can see that indeed, in many of these regions, there is a systematic increase in the phase of the activation as a function of constituent structure. So there's slower and slower activation. 
Even in this region, it looks flat because it's hard to estimate, but if you look closely, you have a more sustained activation for the uh, conditions that have a high constituent structure, that are the ones like in pink and light blue here, there is more sustained activation which is shifted to the right. By the way, these regions are also organized at different times. So if you look at the absolute values of these phases, they are not the same, and it looks like these regions of the STS are responding faster, and this region in the orbital part of the interior frontal gyro is responding slower. So we can map this phase onto the cortex, and we've done that in several previous experiments, actually, and there's very systematic organization, which is also very intriguing. So we find that the primary auditory area and the surroundings are the fastest to respond. They have the fastest phase, and basically they are in line with the auditory stimulus in the case of an auditory experiment here. But uh, as you go to the uh, more lateral regions of the temporal lobe and towards the more anterior regions, you can see by their colors here that the phases become slower and slower in response to the same auditory stimulus. And so we have much slower responses all along the STS. It gets slower at the temporal pole and even slower still in uh, the inferior frontal region. So there is a sort of systematic organization here, a sort of gradient. And what's very exciting, I think, is that we already find this gradient in the very young baby. So uh, my wife, Gislaine, is involved in doing experiments of this kind also with uh, two-month-old babies, and we have acquired the techniques to be able to do fMRI safely in very young babies. Uh, initially, the images just showed that the perisylvian cortex was being activated by spoken language, just like it is in adults. And it did include, right from the start, this inferior frontal region. We confirmed later that, indeed, the left inferior frontal region is being activated by spoken language. And in this picture, you see what happens when you present just a short sentence to the baby. And uh, you see a whole series of activations that are uh, really you need this sine and cosine model in order to pick them up because they have very different delays that are uh, depicted by these different colors here. So very fast response in the, uh, nearby the primary auditory region. You can see it here, uh, here, sorry. And then it gets slightly slower on the back here and especially slower along the temporal lobe towards the front of the temporal lobe and the slowest is in the inferior frontal region, okay, in Broca's area. So some kind of systematic organization uh, which we can see here. What's nice about this phase information is its absolute timing information that we can compare, assuming, of course, there is a lot of assumption. There is the assumption that the bold response is the same, but uh, therefore we can compare the absolute values of these phases for infants and adults. And you can see that the organization is similar, but the phases are slightly slower in infants. So for instance, it's green here uh, in Broca's area, whereas it's more yellow, which means slightly slower response. But basically, it looks like the integration system for language is already present in the young baby. And we'd like to make a suggestion here that there is indeed a similar hierarchical organization already somewhat present in the macaque brain as has been shown by anatomical studies, then there is as well some projections uh, uh, to uh, the inferior frontal uh, region in the macaque brain. And we suggest that, of course, what we are seeing with fMRI is not directly synaptic delays, but it is the consequence, perhaps, of an architecture that allows you to build up constituent structures by successive integration operations. We don't exactly know how they work, but it could be that either during evolutionary times uh, or during developmental times, a form of neuronal recycling, um, we uh, take this architecture that is basically shared by all primates, may have some variants in the humans, maybe they have more levels in the humans, and we transform it so that uh, it can process higher and higher levels of language. That's a simple suggestion, although I cannot yet flesh it out completely in terms of the neural code behind it. So I'd like to go back to this constituent experiment. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you about a small control we did, which uh, was uh, quite simple. We uh, wondered whether the sequential structure of language alone could explain some of our findings. So what we did here was we took non-right branching sentences and we took non-constituents of three words or four words as a separate condition. So you can see here that these words occur in a sequence in the sentence, like du pommier a, du pommier a réveillé, but of course they don't form a legitimate linguistic constituent. 
And when we string three of these together, or four, or four of them or three of them together here, uh, we get, of course, a 12 words condition, which can be compared to the others. Um, if it is a purely associationist view of language that uh, is responsible for the activations we're seeing, then the three word constituent, sh three word non constituent, should look just like the three word constituent. And likewise, the four word non constituent should look just like the four word constituent. But of course, if we believe in a structural perspective, and we believe in uh, actual tree-like constituents, then these conditions are not constituents, and they should behave much more like one-word or two-word conditions, right? Because there is really just one-word constituent here, or two-word constituent. So uh, the diagram here is a little bit hard to read, but these are the two control conditions. And um, basically, um, in, a, in a nutshell, they are too low. Their activation is too low to be comparable to the uh, contrasting C3 and C4 constituents. So for instance, uh, maybe we can uh, see that in one of these diagrams. Let's pick this one here. Here, with normal constituents, you jump from this level of activation to this one, from C1 to C2, C3, and C4. So constituents of one, two, three, or four words. But this is the non-constituent three-word condition. You can see how low it is. It's, it's essentially the same level as just one word. Okay. So it looks like whenever we could test it, it really is the nature of the constituent that matters, not the sequential structure of language. Of course, maybe we can think of better tests for that in the future. I want also to point to one aspect of the findings which we're still not sure what to make of. I've been showing you these diagrams, like here in the anterior STS, where you see the activation uh, nicely linearly increasing as a function of constituent structure, and you can see the profile of activation here. But the axis is plotted in log scale. So what that means is that the activation increases in most of these regions logarithmically uh, as a function of the number of words that go inside a constituent. So it looks like an interesting mathematical rule that maybe is telling us something about what the constituents are made of. There may be some kind of internal compression so that uh, we squeeze together in a neural space uh, in as a logarithmic function of the number of words. Um, one possibility is that the model, therefore, would need to be revised in this way with a sort of less than linear increase in the amount of activation as a function of new words coming in. And uh, one possibility is that, of course, there is a sort of predictive aspect of language so that the new incoming words are more predictable. They fit in, in an existing structure, and so they require less activation incrementally in order uh, to be encoded. We don't really know, but I think this is an important constraint on the kind of neural code that we should be expecting. So this is a summary of the results. Uh, you can see the network for normal language on the left here with the areas in red, and the reduced network for Jabberwocky here in red as well, all in the left hemisphere. There is some right hemispheric temporal pole activation as well. Um, but you can see that there is also a lot of decrease in activity. And again, we don't really know what to make of this. These are areas where the signal is monotonically related to constituent structure, but in the opposite direction. And you see they are all outside of the language area. So we're not sure whether they're really coding or just a sort of temporary uh, deactivation because the subject is orienting towards language. But it's quite intriguing that they occupy a very broad network. Maybe Jean-Pierre will say a word about that. That includes the dorsolateral and more anterior prefrontal cortex. Uh, parietal uh, dorsal regions in both hemispheres, as well as a, a lot of medial activity here in the cingulate and uh, precuneus region. So a big network which shows more activation for objects that you can't easily code, that do not fit in the pattern of language. We replicated this study with spoken language, so uh, same sort of organization. Now we were expecting the logarithm, so we actually selected 16 words and uh, therefore we had a power of two, we could divide it more easily. We removed the prosodic cues so that there was one word at a time, basically presentation, so cutting and pasting was possible with the stimuli, and the task was simply to detect a change of speaker. But this study we did with spoken language, the whole idea was we could also compare with music. As you know, Lerdal and Jackendorf pr proposed that uh, tonal music is organized according to hierarchical tree structures, both for metric and tonal structures. And uh, so we try to mimic our language manipulation with music to try to see whether constituent structure was also present in the same areas for music. Uh, by taking Mozart pieces, which are of course extremely well organized, we selected four bars of Mozart, and then we basically we destroyed it. And uh, forgive me Mozart, 
but I will have you listen to some of these stimuli. So here we rearranged a little bit Mozart so that it ends well with the cadence, but uh, this is Mozart. Now, so here you had two phrases, right? was eight. <laughs> okay, so this is this is this is a continuum from Mozart to Stockhausen or something like that. But <laughs> all right. So uh, again, the task was just to detect a local change in time of, of the instrument. Um, so here is uh, the network I showed you for written language, and on the right is the network where we see increases for spoken language. And you can see how nicely similar the networks are. There's a little bit less activation in this more middle structure here. There may be something specific to reading here, we're not sure. But by and large, it's the same network. So spoken and written language show very similar activation. You can see here, for instance, the onset of the sentence is here, and you can see the buildup of activation lasting much longer and going much higher for the structured sentences with 16 words stringing together as constituents as opposed to just a list of words here and all of the intermediate levels. It's very nicely uh, constructing. Um, we also have these deactivations. Here is this example of the precuneus showing deactivation and again very nicely monotonically related to structure. What about music? So I keep spoken language on the right. These are the same subjects and there is very little organization for music actually. There is some of it and we lowered the threshold here to 10 minus 3. If uh, you can see there's some of it in the temporal pole and here in the right uh, superior temporal sulcus, it does not survive correction. What does survive is these deactivations once again in the left and right frontal cortices. We can lower the threshold and then they become really massive and we do see these activations appearing. So they are present, but they are not very massive. Uh, one way we can look for them is to use an approach which was developed by F. Fedorenko at MIT uh, with Nancy Canwisher, we start with the regions that we know from the reading study. Uh, so these are the existing activations. We added uh, an activation in the Brodmann area 44. And within these voxels, we can look then for an effect of music. And we, what's nice about this is we can look for the peak activation to language in every single subject, and it might vary in location a little bit. And then at that peak, we look for the music effect. So it's a more sensitive analysis that takes into account inter-individual variability. And then we find the effect. And we find it in musicians, but we don't find it in non-musicians. I didn't tell you that 20 subjects were professional musicians, 20 were non-musicians. So basically, if you are a musician, then you have a sort of internal language of music, and you get these activations that overlap with the language system. I think this is similar to some old studies by Tom Bever. Uh, you can see that it's a uh, temporal pole, and especially the inferior frontal regions that show the structure effect for music. But there is none for non musicians, although we have evidence that they do recognize the structuring of the music. So there is something about training here with these areas. And the contribution uh, is still very modest for, for music compared to language. Um, I'm still struck by the opposite effect, this distributed network which involves dorsal prefrontal cortex activated more by incoherent stimuli. Maybe this is the important finding. We don't know. But here it's illustrated, so you can see this whole network of deactivations. In the musicians only, it becomes very significant. And it's essentially the same network as for language, and it shows this decrease in activation, and there's more structure. So one speculation, maybe dorsolateral prefrontal cortex could be involved in a sort of long-distance network that searches for coherence within the destructured stimuli. Now I want to spend the next uh, five minutes speaking about mathematics. We tried to do the same experiments with mathematical structures, and we did it with equations, uh, or rather expressions, mathematical formulas, if you like. So we started with this sort of expressions here, which clearly have a tree structure. And they can be left branching or right branching. They always have two levels of parentheses, though, so three levels of nesting. And we progressively destructure them by keeping an element and scrambling the rest. Okay. So here there is just one element, 3 minus 2 or 3 plus 2 here. And at the bottom, there is just complete scrambling. There's no way you can make sense of this organization. Um, what's very different from language is that it's simultaneous, of course, and not sequential. And this may be crucial. 
So uh, first thing we did is monitor eye movement with this sort of uh, situation, purely behavioral studies where subjects had to calculate the, the results. And the finding was that subjects are extremely sensitive to uh, the syntactic organization of the stimuli. You can see one trial, this is just one trial here where the order of the fixations is indicated by this scale and you see the subject is going directly to this part, then spending some time on this part of the equation and then here and then here. And this has been a very systematic finding by Mariano Sigman in Buenos Aires that regardless of the tree structure, subjects' eyes will follow it extremely tightly, okay, suggesting they're very sensitive to the structure. The first fixation always goes slightly to the left of the center of the equation. So you can see that here. But immediately afterwards, the eye, as a function of time, which is vertical here, follow the location of the structures in the equation. So here the structure is on the right, they go to the right, and then they go to the left. If it is a center embedded structure, they go to the center, and then they go to the right or to the left, or center, left, right. Okay. Very clear following of the structure. The eye movements are very fast, and basically, the, the I, I, I guess I didn't show you this, the subjects are fixating here, so they have to make a first saccade towards the object. That first saccade is not affected by structure, but the second one, is, so it's extremely fast, it's about uh, just a few hundreds of milliseconds before they get influenced by structure. We then went to imaging, the fMRI and MEG, I'll show you a little bit of both. The task had to be a little bit different here and what we did was we asked subjects to basically memorize one object and compare it with another. So they were shown two formulas at a 1.5 second interval. They always belong to the same syntactic level, zero to three, and the subject had to decide whether they were identical or not. So they had to get a sort of fast memory for this whole sentence. It was difficult. And uh, half of the time, two objects were swapped on this equation, either two digits or two operators. The behavior showed very clearly a sensitivity to the structure of these equations. So um, here we see errors and reaction times. They all look the same, whether it's left branching or right branching. Syntax affected the ability to respond same. So the same trials are the match trials here. You can see that the more structured the equations, the easier it gets, faster and more accurate. And especially on the different trials with operators being swapped, you can see that there is a very strong effect of syntax, much less actually on when the digits were swapped. It's quite interesting because it suggests there might be a level of syntax and, and a separate level of semantics inside these mathematical equations. So we're much less sensitive to where the digits were. So there is clear behavioral evidence for syntactic structure building operations, but the imaging with fMRI showed that a monotonic relation with the structure of expressions was not found at all in the language areas. It was found in completely different areas of the uh, fusiform gyrus here, left and right. You can see that um, also, contrary to the language organization, the more structure there is in the equation, the less activation there is in these areas. More lateral uh, extra striate areas here, as well as intraparietal sulcus, a very familiar area for us for uh, calculation, and this more precentral region, which also appears in many calculation studies. And this is in the right hemisphere, though it's not significant in the left hemisphere. So all of these areas show actually less activation when there is more structure. And we don't really know what this means, but it is different from language both in localization and in the pattern of activation. We tried again the same trick of looking for the specific language areas in, speci in these subjects with a language localizer for each subject. And uh, only three regions barely, barely reach significance at 0.05. And you know, we are really searching for specific ROIs here. And you can see the profile of activation as a function of this levels of structure. Three means a lot of structure in mathematics. You can see this is virtually flat, it's barely significant. This is a bit more pronounced, but it's in the context of a global deactivation of the orbital part. And this is the posterior STS, showing not a very nice monotonic relation. So we believe that really, if there is a, a contribution of language areas, it's really minimal, minimal uh, for a mathematical structure. I'm almost finished. So, um, and this fits very nicely with studies of patients that have shown that you can be deeply aphasic and still be able to understand uh, the syntactic structures of mathematics and solve algebraic equations, for instance. Um, so this is a comparison just to show you how different it is, the language network here, 
and the more uh, actually negative going activations in uh, the case of mathematics. We have all of the ev evidence from MEG as well. That there's very fast extraction of syntactic structures of mathematical expressions already at about 150 milliseconds in the posterior regions of uh, both hemispheres actually. And you can see this monotonic relation here. Uh, in these regions actually with MEG we capture a positive effect, which is completely monotonic, which suggests that at this level there is a positive encoding of the structure probably just at the visual level, just like we have a visual word form area, we seem to have uh, a representation of the structure of equations early on in the visual system of these people who are mathematically trained. And this is a positive effect. And in fMRI, we believe that the effect reverses perhaps because of the top-down effect of having to memorize these structures. And of course, when they are destructured, uh, then uh, they are harder to memorize and the behavior was compatible with that. So it's nice to find this positive effect, but again, it's completely outside of the language areas, suggesting that the visual system of these mathematicians is already encoding the structure of the stimuli. We even have an influence of the parenthesis structure on very early uh, retinotopic cortex at the occipital pole here. What's happening here is we are making a contrast for whether the parentheses at the deeper level are on the right side or on the left side, okay? And it makes a difference. And the difference is very significant and you can see it's a bilateral effect. You systematically get more activation contralateral to where the parentheses were found in the equation. And I, I can explain why it looks reversed here, but yeah, actually it's just that effect, the effect of the presence of opening and closing parentheses. So it looks like early in the visual system, parentheses are playing the role of grouping a little area of the, of the visual cortex and making it salient. And in this last slide, I'm just speculating that the use of parentheses in mathematical language may be a little bit similar, taking advantage of the ability to integrate over contours in the visual system, which is a very old ability present in uh, other primates as well. And it is interesting that early on in the history of writing, we were making use of these devices in order to light up a particularly important person or name, uh, like the name of the king. And then mathematicians progressively adopted or co-opted this uh, system, maybe precisely because in the visual cortex, it has the effect of amplifying the activation. But as you can see, it's a device which is coding syntax, which is coding it inside the visual system and not at all in the language system. So conclusions. First, there is the optimistic message that using brain imaging techniques, we are making progress in characterizing the neural code for the constituent structure of language. And there is converging evidence for a core set of areas in the posterior superior tensile sulcus and in the inferior frontal gyrus in two regions. And they are, of course, interconnected via the arcuate and uncellate fasciculi. And there is a lot of converging evidence from existing studies uh, in brain imaging as well as lesion patients. For instance, a recent study by Laurie Tyler suggesting that precisely those areas uh, correlate when they are lesioned with the syntactic deficits of the patients. MEG and intracranial recordings in the future will provide insights into the dynamics of that system. But then there is the surprising conclusion that recursion in music and especially in mathematics seems to engage other regions of the brain. And this is, in mathematics at least, is convergent with other studies by uh, Monty and Oshesson, for instance. Um, so maybe recursion is distributed in all of the brain's area. Maybe humans have a specific organization of the layers of cortex that makes it possible to do recursion everywhere in the system. Or there is the alternative possibility that maybe there is a um, global workspace network of areas involving dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that may be able to do effortful recursive operations and then we transfer them to all of these other systems. Because after all, all that I showed you today was, uh, at least for structure, was based on adult imaging, expert adults, experts in language, experts in mathematics, experts in music, and they all have their representations of syntax in uh, what seems to be specialized areas, but this leaves open the possibility of a more general system for coding uh, structures and then transferring them. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, let me just take a, a minute uh, to uh, uh, let anyone take, ask a quick clarification question or technical question, actually, although, uh, well, the slides are already gone, but uh, uh, we do have the discussion period afterwards, but if there's any quick clarification question, uh, let me know, and uh, we should use the microphone. Um, 
you, you in, in, in the first part on, on language and talking about constituents, you phrased it in terms of the size of the constituent that you decreased gradually. Um, but strictly speaking, it, it was the size of the biggest constituent in the relevant presentation because in the, in the case where you presented a, a full sentence with 12 words, the 12 words match the size of the biggest constituent, but there are also lots of little constituents inside that, and, and you seem to be assuming that that didn't matter, that the effects were not you know, cumulative over number or size of or total constituents. Actually, I was incorporated this notion of a uh, buildup of activation. So uh, uh, you're right. I mean, the, the parameter in the plots is the size of the maximal constituent, but the assumptions behind looking for a monotonic increase is that there is a progressive buildup. And in fact, in MEG, uh, I didn't show you this, but if we stop after six words, well, of course, the 12 words and the six words conditions are the same because you don't know whether you're going to go on building up more and more uh, larger constituents, right? So that's exactly what we see. Uh, they, they you're absolutely right. There is a progressive buildup, and it may stop at any time in our conditions, but subjects don't know whether it's going to stop at two or at three or at four or at six or at 12, and we see this continuing buildup. What one could imagine a, ra a rather exciting extension of this kind of work if you take a, a given sentence that might have different analyses under different proposals by different people, uh, which would correspond to different <laughs> degrees of complexity of constituent structure, which you could perhaps detect. Well, I, I, I know I totally agree with you. It be, uh, I mean, I would think that activation in these areas becomes a potential index of complexity of structures. And especially when we do it with Jabberwocky, I think we have a pretty pure index of the complexity of structure. So, uh, so we've been discussing also with, with Luigi Rizzi uh, about uh, doing the exactly this sort of reversed experiments where activation would become an index for the linguist. But I'm not sure we are quite ready for that, but we could try. <laughs>